Uh, How are you doing, John? Very well. Very good. Thank you all for coming. I know between students and faculty, it's a crazy time of year. My blood pressure has been out off the roof here lately, mm -hmm. and lots of things going on. But uh, very excited that you all are here to visit with somebody that I've been working with for the past couple of years. Uh, I'm on the World Trade Center board, and many of you all, of course, know about the World Trade Center out of New York. And Darren, sometime you may just, in your comments, talk a little bit about the structure of World Trade sure. Centers, uh, about individual states. But anyway, we have a World Trade Center board, a World Trade Center here in Kentucky. And for the past three or four years, I've really worked hard to integrate agriculture into being affiliated and working relationship with World Trade Center. And I always tell the board not only, you know, is a, a trade important to agriculture, but we have a lot of contacts and a lot of opportunities to interact and, and from a political standpoint, from an economic standpoint, with uh, folks, uh, you know, the UPSs, the Valvolines, the, uh, you've got what, lots of different Sure, probably interact with there. 250 to 300 companies a year. Right. Yeah. But anyway, we have Darren Shrebnik with us today. Darren is the Chief Trade Officer for the World Trade Center. Um, Darren has a really interesting background that maybe he'll get into a little bit. He's certainly, I guess in recent years, been connected with Nissan mm -hmm. and spent some time in the Middle East mm -hmm. uh, with lots of different um, uh, companies in interest. Um, one of the things that the World Trade Center does besides having trade missions and interacting with folks uh, coming in as well as outgoing trade missions is also on the educational front and they have a lot stronger working relationship with the Gatton College. In fact we have some certification programs within uh, the, the Gatton program as part of their MBA program. So um, Darren if you just want to start sure. off talk a little bit about yourself sure. and about the role of the Trade Center. Sure. And uh, we had Darren last week in front of the Kentucky Ag Council, so he wants to learn a lot more about agriculture mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely, absolutely. My background is, as Will said, my background is mostly in the automotive sector and then also construction. Mm -hmm. I worked on a, a project on the UAE, Saudi Arabian border, for about a year. It was nice and cool there, about <laughs> 120 degrees. <laughs> um, but little my background is I, I majored in Japanese linguistics in college. Uh, went to Connecticut College in New London, Connecticut. Um, it was a popular major. There was three of us in the major. Uh, my parents were, I think, a little surprised and maybe a little worried because they were of kind of the pre-med law degree mentality. And I said, Japanese linguistics. I think my father <laughs> said, what are, what are we paying for? You know, what are, what are you going to do after that? But I ended up actually working in Japan for four years. I worked as a translator for the Japanese government uh, in Hiroshima. Uh, I did not know my salary before I went there. To give you an idea of how excited I was, I signed the piece of paper. That's how excited I was to go. It would be a little different today, but uh, I went there for three years. I worked uh, with delegations, uh, ambassadors, translated documents from Japanese to English. Uh, I even took a group of hula dance uh, troops from Hawaii around for a week to translate for them. Uh, I was the guy in the suit with all the hula dance woman behind me. It was kind of an interesting experience for both. story. Yeah, yeah, there's some stories from Japan. Um, so I spent three years there and then I came back to the United States and I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do with this background. Um, you know, kind of a natural progression, I think, for Japanese is working for the automotive sector. Um, and so I ended up working for the automotive sector for about nine years. I started out actually in, in freight forwarding. So I... Um, I worked for, I actually walked into a Japanese company, I had moved to Nashville, and I did some uh, kind of these contract jobs. And so they're always looking for an interpreter to do translation when they build a new part and they want to get that cell, so to say, up and running, they hire an interpreter. And so you come in and then within about three months, that cell is up and running, they're producing parts and kind of your job is over and sometimes, you know, you get, you stay on board, you know. So I did that for uh, a bit, but then I wanted to get more permanent uh, work, so I walked into a freight forwarder that I knew in Nashville, Tennessee, that was uh, Nippon Express. And they move uh, most of the automotive goods that you, you know, the companies that are here, there's 197 Japanese companies uh, in the state, um, are moved by Nippon Express. They're customs cleared and they're moved by Nippon Express. In fact, some of that, all the guys that come in, 
uh, that are engineers, uh, they are, uh, all their household relocation is also done by Nippon Express. It's a loss leader for the company. They make no money because what it is is they get down on the personal side, moving their product in, moving their household goods, and then they transition to move their commercial goods. It's a really brilliant way of, of getting business. So I actually worked in household relocation for six months. I worked on, I worked on trucks. Um, as you can tell, they did not hire me for my brute strength. Um, and I, I was hired because I could read the boxes. So I did that for a bit. Um, and we were talking a little bit about you know, how, how to get into international trade. Quite frankly, a lot of people in international trade end up, they start out in the docks working to see how product moves in and out, right? You get to see on a ground level how product moves, what papers are with those documents, the discrepancies, and then from there I moved into the office. Um, and when I was in the office they um, asked me, do you want to become a customs broker? Um, I first said, well what's that? <laughs> let, let, let me know about it first before I say yes. And, they, and I went for my customs broker examination. Um, Passed that and then had my background check with the, with the FBI. Um, there's about 12,000 customs brokers in the United States, licensed brokers, and we're in charge. We pretty much, our customs is here. Uh, the importer is here. We stand in the middle and make sure that goes as planned. And there's probably about 300, 400 pages of regulation, and the average importer doesn't want to deal with it. So they pay a customs broker to take care of that import in the United States. So I brought in bumpers. I brought in... Uh, finished vehicles. Um, There's times I actually brought in um, some things from people going on mission trips to Africa, coming back, return goods, things like that. I get a real chance. The great thing about working in Nashville as opposed to working in Chicago or LA is I was only one of a couple brokers. So the advantage with that is they don't give you one piece of the pie. They Anyone who walks in the door, you got to handle it. And that's was really one of the reasons I think I was able to kind of expand and go beyond automotive in a way. Did that for a bit and then went for Nissan. So at Nissan I brought cars in from Japan. Um, I dealt a lot with NAFTA. It's in the news right now, of course, as you know. Uh, USMCA, the new. I dealt a lot with getting money back. So like for instance, the first time we brought goods from Mexico, we didn't know if it was qualified for NAFTA and we went back and got that money. So I was in a fortunate position to say I could brag about, I brought back, um, I think I think a million dollars at one point to get money back for the company. Um, after Nissan, I ended up working um, for World Trade Center. Um, I worked with Harvey Wilkinson over at the MBA program to design with the, the team there a program for three or four days to teach the facets of international business to MBA students. Absolutely loved it. I'm proud of the fact that seven years on, we're, we're still doing the program. At some point, talk a little bit about that because we yeah. Carl is the director of our graduate program. And oh, okay. We've had, we've had several students to participate in that program. Yeah, that's true. They did drop in, yeah, for the, yeah. For the program. So that, that program pretty much covers the major aspects. We always have a corporate collaborator. Um, very proud to say that this year is babbling. Um, so we have case studies, and these case studies are really not made up. They're actually live. They're not from... 1976. I mean, they are things they're thinking about right now. For instance, the quick loop model that you're familiar with for Valvoline is not the model that is in other countries. It's mostly the product. It's not the actual place you go into and have your oil changed. Would that work in a foreign country? That's an issue they're struggling with right now to figure out. Does it make sense to do that? Would it be better just to actually have more of that distributor model and not have any brick and mortar in that country? And that's a live case study. And quite frankly, they're very interested in what the students dig up. And I know for uh, you know, Alltech and a few other companies, big ass fans, you may know, um, they, um, it's funny how now I say big ass fans, I don't even think about it, you know. <laughs> I just say the name. Um, but those companies have actually benefited from the students, uh, you know, doing research for them. Things they didn't know about, maybe they didn't have time to dig up, or resources they may knew, or relatives or friends that maybe were living overseas, they ask questions to. So it's a really great opportunity. So how, is Harvey still involved with that? Harvey is still very involved. Is Harvey and Carl, I can't, Gustafsson, I think is his last name. Okay. Um, he, uh, and then we also work with, we have a contractor from the World Trade Center side who's a former head of global marketing for Jelly Belly, who was also a professor at UC Berkeley. 
So in combination with all these folks, we designed the program. It's over a period of three days, but two days, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday, the students have to work on the case studies on Friday. I call Friday Shark Tank because they have to present in front of the actual corporate collaborators. So it's pretty intimidating. They get two, maybe about 72 hours to present to someone who may be the head of that function of the company. Um, so that's in January. In so January. Is it too late to participate in that? No, no. I mean, I think probably maybe instruction with Carl and, and Harvey might be good. Um, it's about 50, I think usually it's about 55 students. It's, I guess it's early before the spring break starts. It's 7th, 8th, and then 11th. So uh, students elect to come back. It's considered like a certificate uh, program. And we also teach a, as well an abbreviated version of that at uh, University of Louisville as well. Um, that's a little bit about that. Um, uh, my, I ended up working for ISCO Industries, uh, polyethylene piping company. About a year in, they said, um, we have a special project for you. I I've learned over the years that when your manager in a private company says you have a special project, that it's something that you may want to ask more questions about. <laughs> um, they sent me over to the Middle East for Abu Dhabi for about a month. Uh, I set up an office over there for them. We had, we had security a $45 million installation project for a nuclear power plant on the UAE Saudi Arabian border. Mm -hmm. Civilian, I should say, to be clear about that. Um, and so I ended up staying, I was supposed to be there for about a month. Um, they knew my background in logistics, they knew I lived overseas. So they said, you are the person, we want to bring people in. Uh, I had to deal with UAE military forces. There's a special unit there that actually deals with critical infrastructure. So I was there for dealing with that. Um, I lived in like a barracks, essentially, kind of like a military barracks. Um, and I was there for about a year. And then came back to, to the U.S. with ISCO, worked for them for another couple of years. And then they started kind of moving away from domestic, and that's how I got to World Trade Center. So that's kind of my long and convoluted story. But my my kind of my skill sets are in international trade uh, policy as well. I deal with. Um, I basically sometimes at World Trade Center I describe it as like a, a second opinion service. So someone says I got to meet with my boss on Friday at 4 p.m. It's a new project. I'm looking at bringing product into, let's say Argentina, um, and I want to know how much it's going to cost. And I think it's this. I'm going to send you a spreadsheet and tell me if I'm missing anything. Or it's the other thing where they give me a blank sheet of paper and say, I have no idea what I'm doing. Please help me, right? Um, and then I also do mock audits. I actually go into clients and act like I'm a, I'm a U.S. Customs officer. And I pull apart all of their declarations to U.S. Customs and make sure that they're in proper order in the event that they may get an audit. So they'd rather get an audit from me as opposed to an audit from a federal law enforcement officer. And we have companies here in Kentucky that have been audited by Customs. So um, it's pretty helpful. So I hope that helps as a kind of an introduction. Any questions at this point? You know, one of the things, again, those of us in ag, we're, we're used to talking a lot about trade and exports. Sure. We deal a lot with commodity mm -hmm. trade. Uh, we have national associations that work with big agribusiness firms that may mm -hmm. have individuals that have expertise like you and mm -hmm. linking up buyers and sellers. But you know, one of the things we're trying to do in ag is to, to get small businesses, if not farmers, involved in mm -hmm. international trade. And they're very intimidated sure, yeah. by what to do. Sure, yeah. So again, the World Trade Center sure. has linkages out there. Mm -hmm. They have uh, expertise that can help them go from point A to point B. So mm -hmm. just talk about sure. the small business setting, what the Trade Center sure. might be able to... Sure, well, I'll give you the example of everyone's favorite example, beer, right? Everyone's favorite example. So um, there's a company in Louisville called Against the Grain. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've heard of the company. Mm -hmm. They now sell beer to, I think, probably 21 countries. Mm -hmm. And they worked with us initially. I can't take credit for that at all. It was actually before my time. But um, they came to the World Trade Center and said, listen, we're trying to sell our product overseas. We think it has... A lot of potential. We've worked with 
We've visited overseas, we've done field research, which means visiting a lot of pubs. That's what field research is. It's a wonderful job. Where, where do we sign up? Yeah, where do we sign up? And so we work with them in terms of, of giving them the logistics aspect. You know, so when you when you ship your product overseas, you gotta get a container, you know, or air shipment. You know, these are the things you have to tell them. This is your harmonized tariff schedule number, which is a code that's used to export out of the United States. That translates into the duty rate overseas. You have to have a bill of lading, you have to have a commercial invoice. Commercial invoice must have this information on it. And then from there, you know, they're working with some other agencies as well to find buyers overseas. So it might be Foreign Agricultural Service, uh, it might be the U.S. Commercial Service, which I'm not sure how familiar you are with the U.S. Commercial Service. It's an arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce. It's not a regulatory arm, essentially it's a marketing arm. So they get a profile of like the beer and then they go over to a foreign outpost, a U.S. embassy that has a, every U.S. embassy has a trade division, and say, okay, this is the profile of the company. This is the beer they make. Uh, this is the distinguishing characteristics, so to say, of the beer. They had some really great marketing and wonderful cans that they were using. And uh, do you think there's a market here? And then they do an evaluation in the country, and they say, actually, yeah, we've got three potential distributors. We've got them lined up for you. Now, we can either through a conference call, Skype, whatever, maybe you can meet them, talk about maybe their capabilities, you know, kind of vet them in a way. We've already vetted them for you. Um, they do that at a low cost. And then from there, you know, they start selling overseas and they work with, you know, we introduce them to banks locally that have expertise in international payment mechanisms. Um, kind of the full life cycle, sales life cycle. And then also helping them with some of the, the problems that they may encounter. Um, as you can imagine right now, it is probably not the most stable trade policy environment. So how to navigate those waters. Either how to navigate it in the sense of telling them some bad news, that their customer may have to pay 25% on retaliatory duties, or maybe ways for them to avoid that through some sort of exclusion process, some sort of exception. So in essence, we're kind of helping these companies all the way. I would think of it as a hub and spoke, because at the end of the day, we're not doing everything. I'm not a lawyer. I know how international sales contracts go badly. I've seen it personally, painfully. I've seen some horrible situations, um, which thousands and millions of dollars are on the line. Um, but we're introducing them to those partners in the business community that can help them do some due diligence overseas. Uh, we have a few due diligence companies that are ex-CIA people that actually do intelligence uh, gathering on foreign companies. Um, we've got some lawyers that we know that you know work with Japanese companies, and we try to, as much as possible, uh, avoid them to use avoiding uh, the use of Google <laughs> to find their resources, right? So that we know the provider uh, instead of them calling a one eight hundred number or them um, going to someone that may be overstating their qualifications, and that does happen, as you can imagine. Um, we can introduce them to someone that we know has executed uh, successfully. That's kind of, in essence, kind of what we're, we're doing. Um, Will had mentioned also to the, the education arm. So we do education throughout the year. Obviously, UK, UofL, we teach a three-day boot camp that actually Will attended recently, which is 21 hours of international business instruction with 12 instructors over three days. Um, and had, uh, Jordan here, his previous employer was was BP's. They had, you had this representative from Shell that did some of the training, right? <laughs> no, her family was affiliated with Shell. Yeah, there was a, a FedEx representative who used to be with, with BP, or her father was. Um, but we try to cover everything. We try to cover international tax. We try to cover uh, international sales agreements. Um, as much as possible, we try to maintain kind of a... And a little exposure, but not, not getting into like a legal conference or a tax conference. These are folks that the profile is generally a logistics analyst, logistics manager, inside sales, outside sales folks. And then we also do one-on-one, -on -one, or I should say on-site programs. I go on-site to a company and do a, a, do a, a full-blown export 101. There's supposed to be three hours. My last one was five and a half. And the reason they're so long is if you get everyone in the room and it's one company, um, there, there tends to, I tend to be a little bit of a therapist, I, I, I'll admit, because you get CFO and sales in the same room, it's like, you know, <laughs> like oil and water sometimes. 
So we work with them in that export session to educate them, but also to kind of help them in a way to work better with each other, right? So that the CFO understands some of the financial implications and understands how sales can work better with the CFO. Um, so we kind of help them in that way. I've been on their side of the table, so I've had my experience as a trade compliance manager and it's a very unpopular role in companies. You're kind of like the military police of, the, uh, of a company. Um, you kind of have to tell executives sometimes what to do, what not to do. Um, but it's a critical function to make sure that they don't get into and trouble. The comment the other day is, this is a session where you're going to learn how not to go to jail. Yeah, yeah, we had one of those, a <laughs> couple of those uh, here and there. And I've prevented a few of those uh, over, there's a couple of them I can talk about, and some of them I can't talk about actually that are a little extreme, but there's been situations where I've seen companies kind of go a route where the dollar sign is very big, but the due diligence is not really good, and it's someone who's maybe a bad actor, you know. Um, but that's kind of, in essence, the World Trade Center, uh, how it operates. And we do a little more with trade policy. As you can imagine, now it's becoming much more important. Um, so one of the functions we kind of have is, in some sense, to guide companies to make sure that their, their operations and their management of the operations are not based upon purely the media. Because at the end of the day, the media is not going to be the source of information for how you negotiate. I mean, when they say, for instance, that the tariff is going to be 25%, I tell them to hold up and we have to go to the actual source of where that information is and say, okay, let's look up your number, make sure your number is correct, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. Is your number correct? Then from there, let's see if it's on the list. And if it's on the list, you get to pay 25%. However, there's an ability to get an exclusion based upon certain criteria. Um, so, you know, what does that look like? Can I help you with that? Um, and after I help you with it, we're going to have another, probably have an attorney, international trade attorney, look at it as well, because we want to provide the best case to make that exclusion. Um, it's getting quite hard to actually get exclusions based upon yeah. the trade policies. I was in a meeting actually with the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, and he gave the numbers out on the number of exclusions applications. I forgot. It's probably 54,000? Yeah, was, I think it was between 40 and 50,000. Yeah. So there's, they've there's, been through like seven or 8,000. The <laughs> One of the problems of the Trump administration is, uh, you probably have heard, they don't, they're not staffing very well. There's a lot of ambassadorships that do not exist. I think at last check there was like 29 ambassadors that haven't been assigned yet. Um, and that carries over to other agencies as well. So the exclusions that are we're talking about here, there's two major categories. One is called Section 301, which is from China. So the, the, the argument by the administration is China has infringed on intellectual property. Um, and so there's a forced transfer of, of IP when companies try to form companies over there. That's, the, that's their argument. And because of that, we're going to apply 25% on certain Chinese goods, not all Chinese goods, but it's moving the direction of all Chinese goods, it seems to me, in some regards. We're halfway there. We're halfway there. And um, there is an exclusion process for that. But the interesting thing about it, there has not been one exclusion granted on that side. And the reason is the standard is so high. So this, I'll give you this scenario and tell me if you think an exclusion can be granted. You cannot source the product from any other country. So not just, ex not just from the United States, but any other country you can't source it from. Uh, there has to be an economic impact where people lose their jobs to that extent. Not just, I'm losing a little profit. That's not enough. The product cannot be part of what's called China 2025, which is a, essentially their plan to develop a little more self-sufficiency, as opposed to uh, kind of the, I guess the perception maybe of, of China has been in some ways, you know, more of the inputs that have been used for, for U.S. manufacturing to develop more of the indigenous, you know, where they become a leader in AI and things like that, where they are, in essence, sourcing from other countries, in essence, taking the place of the United States. So with that being the case, there's not a lot of products that would fit that exclusion. I had a client that wanted to import motors from China, 25%. And they said, well, I want to get an exclusion. So I actually pulled, one of the things we do is pull trade statistics from the U.S. Census Bureau. 
from competitive intelligence gathering tools like Peers and Pangeva. These are tools where I can tell you who is exporting corn from Kentucky. I can tell you who is exporting it, what container number, everything. It's all available publicly. Hmm. Um, and then uh, I, we did the statistics for 2017. There was 35 countries where they could have imported from. And their loss would have been 65,000 more they had to pay in duty. I said, you can go for this, but your case is pretty weak. And they also told me there wouldn't be one person laid off. On the steel side, the steel and aluminum is something else. That's like 25% for steel, 10% for aluminum. That's everywhere in the world, not just China. And the, there has been some exceptions granted, but you may have heard that from my home state of Massachusetts, Ms. Elizabeth Warren has actually said, had, had complained that she does not feel like the process is transparent, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't pass the smell test, essentially what she said. And the other thing that's happened is Rusal, which is a Russian company that has ties to Vladimir Putin, was one of the companies that received an exception for the steel and aluminum. <laughs> and there's a lot of subsidiaries of foreign companies in the United States, like Japanese companies here, right, that have received those exclusions. So there's been a lot of exclusions granted. There's probably about 11,000 granted of 54,000. But right now, the process has been brought into question. And I wonder if there's going to be a stop on the number of exclusions. Plus, exclusion is for one year. You can go back retroactively and get the money back. Um, but the, the challenge that I see, with especially with the aluminum side, the Aluminum Association of the United States actually is against this measure. Did you guys, did you know about that? Why would, why would they be against it? Well, in terms of production in the United States, there's primary and secondary aluminum production, right? There's primary or the smelters. Then there's that, like I call that cookie sheet, where you're stamping out a bunch of stuff, right? And then when you make cookies, right? After you stamp it all, you have the rest of that stuff that you put all together again and make another sheet of cookies, right? It's the same thing with aluminum. And so the U.S. does not have the capacity from, a, from a, just a pure capacity standpoint to produce all the aluminum that we need. And so, in essence, we do need the importing to come in. And so some of these companies that are aluminum processors, um, they would like to make sure that they don't pay any duty on that aluminum coming in, the aluminum ingots that they have. So it's interesting. The Aluminum Association said, we don't mind if you put the tariff on China. It's overproduction. There is a evidence of an unfair subsidization of that industry. But that was the advice they gave. But we know what happened, right? So they attended, they did actually did a, a broad-based sanction, or I should say broad-based duties on most countries. There's some exceptions that exist. Korea is one of them. Uh, I think actually Argentina has a quota system as well. So um, that's kind of the current state on that. And then you may just to transition into USMCA, which is the new NAFTA. It's debatable whether it's NAFTA 2.0 or NAFTA 1.5. I would say it's more like NAFTA 1.75, around there. But for that, Mexico and Canada are still subject to aluminum and steel tariffs, which is very interesting. It's a free trade agreement, right? <laughs> so operative word is free. And one thing to note, the new name does not have the word free in it. Um, I, I, my trade policy contact in DC said that was one of Trump's requirements, but the word free would not be in the name. Spoken like a true business person. Nothing is free, right? And Kenny and I had a little bit of dialogue about these retaliatory tariffs. Sure. Maybe Kenny can you talk a little bit about USMC A and how important it is for meat industry and some of the limitations of, of these tariffs. We've kind of talked how it's kind of a mixed bag right now for, for ag in those markets. Yes, I mean, of course, the, the dairy, I guess the most significant thing for ag was probably dairy in the USMCA. But, yes. But even then, I would say it's a fairly small impact. And my understanding, unless I'm wrong, you know better than I would, that, that um, Canada's production control system is still largely in place. Yeah. So all it really affects is the ultra-filter milk for the most part. The class 6 and class 7 products, yeah. I think yeah. that's referred The new to classes it. they've actually created. Yeah. And then um, I was also surprised, too, do you know, I just assumed that the tariffs on um, pork and beef would have gone away with USMC, but evidently they did not. Mm -hmm. They weren't even included in the discussion. So... 
Is it? Uh, I thought they went away from the actual agreement, but there may be retaliatory still. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. They go back to zero, but there's retaliatory tariffs are still in place. Yeah, that's the problem. So this is very interesting. Is there's a little bit of on the dairy side, which is kind of considered the red line initially for the Canadian dairy industry, but in essence, it became a bargaining chip, right? Because they handed over quotas to Canada. I mean to, I'm sorry, EU. The EU and Canada have agreement. And Canada and um, the US have an agreement. And then Canada's part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Remember that? Mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like light years ago, right? But you know, we pulled out of that agreement. So the interesting thing about it is that the, the language in the new NAFTA, I can't call it USMCA yet, Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, is actually some of it is verbatim from TPP. They actually pulled it and they changed like words like the and a. I'm serious. <laughs> um, so on the the dairy side, there's an access. They gave more access to you know, to U.S. dairy, which is a higher percent, right? It's a higher percent. And what we got under TPP, I think it was well. TPP is gone, right? So then yeah. TPP is like 3.25 okay. that EU got for for Canada. And then we got 3.6. Okay. Now, when we say access, I probably should explain what that means. So, have you ever heard of the term, and you may have heard on the news, overrate tariff rate quota? So essentially, you have, you know, let's just give it a, a basic example. 50,000 metric tons of something, okay? After, that's duty free. And then after that, it goes up, it jumps up to a high amount. So in essence, we were just given a higher quota. And do you happen to know what the tariff rate is on, on milk into Canada? It's 270%. To put that into context, the US average, the, the average tariff rate, regular tariff, into Canada is 1.9. So just to give you an idea. So there was more access given, and we gave some more access to Canada with some items like peanuts and things like that. But the problem is, is there are retaliatory duties still in place. and still in place for instance against China. So at the end of the day, it's kind of a wash for the U.S. dairy industry because we didn't give like a ton of access. The supply management program is still in place. Um, now the thing that they did, the U.S. has celebrated is the skim milk and I mean this um, unfiltered, I think it's called, right? Ultra filtered. Ultra filtered, right? So the when Canada exports that, they it's a very low price, so it hurts apparently the world market. So the U.S. says you can you can eliminate that class six and seven pricing, but then in addition, over a certain amount, you actually have to export. You have to actually tax the export, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which by the way you cannot do in the U.S. It's actually against the Constitution, Article One. So we celebrated that. From my viewpoint, I mean it 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 doesn't seem like the access, I mean, yeah, there's some access, but the other countries, retaliatory, not just China, Turkey is taxing my customer, Sazerac, bourbon at 140% now, used to be like 30. So, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, there's actually a, a tremendous impact. How significant was, do you think it was that it's in there where, I guess, essentially Canada and Mexico cannot negotiate with China on their own? I wonder yeah. if that might have been the yeah, that's an interesting point you bring up. So what that what that is, just to explain, is there's a provision in the free trade agreement, which is unheard of in free trade agreements, the history of free trade agreements, that once Canada and Mexico, if they start negotiating with a non-market economy, by definition they're saying that's China, right? They're actually saying China, but we know from Trump's comments that he's referring to China, that the U.S. or Canada or Mexico, whatever, has the ability to pull out of the agreement in six months. It's not a big deal in the sense that it can be done anyways, because Trump was was actually threatening that the whole time. At any time, the president can say NAFTA is gone, and there's six months. It's more symbolic. But I think that, quite frankly, I think Canada and Mexico will ignore it, and they'll actually move forward with agreements. And I think they're going to bank on the fact that they're going to say, what's a non-market economy? What's the definition of that? They're going to be more. They're going to be more. They're kind of, kind of bring the lawyers in, and say, "You said non-market economy. What the hell does that mean?" 
Right, if you're doing trade with them, it sounds like a market economy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, is it is it because they're essentially planning? I mean, what what definition are you giving for that? You know, so I think that I think first of all, China's a, uh, a big enough, I mean, a huge economy that Canada's not going to ignore the country. They're going to do something. It may not be a full fledged free trade agreement, but it's going to be something. And Trump is going to pull that card, and it's going to be a major fight. You know? Of course, all this is under the assumption that all three countries will ratify yeah. the new NAFTA. And I think you know, there's already, from what I read, some discussion with the House turning over to de Democratic leadership that they all want more out of the agreement in terms of some of the labor and environmental issues. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I think the Democrats are going to want the labor and environmental <coughs> issues. Yeah. They're going to push more for that. But the interesting thing was is that Trump did, I think, in some ways forecasted <laughs> some of this because the labor agreement for NAFTA was always in a side letter, which is actually not as enforceable as the actual agreement. It's like an addendum in a way. And the labor now is part of the actual agreement. So they have done something in that regard, but environmental was quite frankly is pretty thin. And I think that they're gonna push for more in the agreement before it's ratified. Now, one scenario that they're talking about is right now NAFTA's in place. Let's call it NAFTA 1.0. NAFTA 1.75, come up later. If the Democrats say we're not going to ratify it, Trump's going to say, all right, I'm going to pull the plug on NAFTA mm -hmm. 1.0 and see what you do. Yeah. So there, there is some hope that they may go ahead and just go ahead and ratify it. Um, it's not like radically different, um, but I do have some thoughts on like automotive, for instance, that affects probably Kentucky is. Um, have you heard of the rules of origin? Have you heard that term before? Mm -hmm. So there's 254 pages of the NAFTA agreement that actually address rules of origin. And it means if this iPhone, right, you know, when it says that it's 62% U.S. content, you know, it's a value, there's the labor involved, I mean, there's all kinds of equations that are used to calculate that. Automotive, to qualify a vehicle, say this is a vehicle in Mexico, if the vehicle is 62.5% origin, NAFTA origin, meaning Mexico, Canada, the U.S., you could bring it in from Mexico duty-free to the U.S. Normally, it's 2.5%. It's so not crazy, but still, 2.5% on a bunch of vehicles, I can tell you, adds up. I paid, we paid $12 million a month just in duties and taxes in Nissan to do business. So... Um, there's a thing in the, in the new NAFTA that says that the car must be 75%, okay? I can tell you, being at Nissan, to get up to 61 was difficult. It's very challenging. So one of the things that people are thinking might happen is they'll say, well, you know what? We'll get all that done in Mexico. We'll beat up on the price and then pay 2.5 for getting NAFTA. I'll move my production down to Mexico. Do you see how that works? Because you can bring a car in from Mexico. You don't have to claim that it's qualified for a free trade agreement. You do that anytime you want to. I did it all the time in automotive. I did it in polyethylene pipe. I didn't know whether the product qualified or not. And the price of compliance versus the price of being audited. I said, fine, okay. I probably pay $10,000 a year. I mean, it's a $400 million company. $10,000 a year is not like a ton of money to basically say, okay, I'm gonna bring it into the country. I don't know if it's qualified or not. Um, so they may do that. So what appears to be something that will create jobs in the United States? Because I might say, well, you know what, we'll have more content here. Uh, I could be wrong. I mean, they could decide to do that and have more content from the United States. Um, but there's another possibility is that it will actually backfire. And they'll just say, make it in Mexico. I don't care about NAFTA, just import it like it's nothing, like anything else pay 2.5%, and that's my cost of doing business. As opposed to making in the U.S., where the costs are going to be more, and then you can't bring in as much Chinese content, right? Or Taiwanese content, or Thai content, whatever you want. Yeah. See, the problem in ag, though, is if we go, if we pull the plug, can we revert back to these pre-NAFTA yes. tariffs, and a lot of them are 30 to 75%. Yeah. My feeling about um, 
my feeling about ag within free trade agreements is that it always becomes collateral damage. I always feel that way. If you look at it, right? I mean, dairy, the Canadian farmers are pissed. Dairy farmers. I mean, they think that they've been completely, you know, because they see they got a free trade agreement with, with uh, EU. That's 3.25% access. The U.S. was 36 They see that as a chipping away of the supply management system. And in some ways, they kind of bargained that out and said, okay, fine, we'll give you that. That was the major thing they gave. And you're right, the, with NAFTA, if you look at, we mentioned automotive, 2.5%. That's not really crazy, right? I mean, you can kind of maybe beat up your suppliers, and I know at Nissan we beat up our suppliers pretty hard, and get that price lower and then pay a lower duty amount. But you're right, with ag, when they snap back to levels 30 40%, people forget Mexico has 40 free trade agreements, or free trade agreements with 40 countries. Um, at one time, Mexico was very protectionist, and without that agreement, it will go back to a level that you would probably average about 25%. You know, so um, and that's always been the case. What? I'm sorry. There are 25% of the uh, value of the good. Gotcha. Yeah. So I mean, if is you it? got if you got a hundred dollar product, right? They're going to be paying twenty five dollars instead of free, right? Essentially. So you know. That's a problem, and and my concern is, and a good example from Kentucky might be soybeans. So 30% of the market apparently goes to China, and um, we know what's happened with soybeans. We've heard of ships being on the water and being literally trying to meet the deadline to hit 25%. Those vessels don't go that fast, right? They've they've gone and then they end up paying the 25%. What's happened is Brazil is a large market export market for soybeans. My girlfriend is Brazilian. She's a little happy about it, <laughs> in a way. She's also American, but... Um, so, you know, if this goes on for a while, and you're a buyer in China, and you're getting a good price, and you're getting good service from your Brazilian supplier, um, are you going to go back to a U.S. supplier? That's the question, right? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Or indirectly go back via the Brazil and you don't even, you're not aware. Yeah, yeah we've got uh, beans that are going from here to Argentina, Argentina That's true. sugar beans to China. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's possible, yeah. I mean, you could be going that direction as well. I mean, automotive is, sometimes has that as well. So you're right, it, the, the thing with ag, I'm always, it, it always feels in many ways that, um, like I, I had asked a question the other day, Will, about, you know, this 12 billion in aid, right, this aid package is, and I heard this expression, trade, not aid, that's the, I guess, the expression is, is, you know, it's great in a way, but um, the markets are not really being opened, really, for the agricultural community overseas, you know, and that's what's really unfortunate. You know? Pardon my ignorance here, but maybe you could educate me sure. on uh, the percent origin, country of origin type element does that even come well, well, does that even come into play on agriculture commodities? Not is normally. Just, okay. Yeah, not normally because if it's only from the ground, there's an assumption. Now, even though they have their inputs too, of yeah. course, but yeah, yeah. I don't think so. not normally. Yeah. Uh, now there's different there's something called in, in free trade agreements called preference criteria. So preference criteria would might be like, for instance, you know, this together. This is Chinese, this is US. I somehow incorporate this into this. There's rules of origin of like, the parts need to shift in terms of their tariff number to the final tariff. So say the tariff, the final tariff is like 8503. Um, this can't be 8501. This has gotta be like 3926. It's gotta move, the part's gotta move to a final assembly that's a very different product. So in essence, in, in layman's terms, you could have some elbow grease in it to get it so it's qualified. With, with uh, agricultural goods, most times it's the preference criterion is, is A. It's called A. There's A, B, C, D. And A is usually, it's from the ground. Iron ore, things like that as well. Um, it doesn't come into play as much, but there are things that relate to phytosanitary restrictions, things like that as well, future agreements. Like if you meet the standards here in the U.S., then you don't have to meet the standards in Mexico, right? It's not like a double, 
you don't have to go through their body like okay the US standard for this particular product is accepted over there that's usually the the advantage on the free trade agreements on the ag side there's also the quota quotas can increase but also standards become a big thing uh, grain to Canada uh, I think it's if it's non Canadian grain I think automatically it's graded a certain way and the new agreement basically says it's it's on par with Canadian grain. There's yeah, some sort of it's the wheat. Wheat, think, yeah. Yeah. Treatment of how they grade the Canadian wheat. Absolutely. You know what I mean? The whole thing started with basically jobs. We're losing jobs. And agriculture complained because they said from a political standpoint, rural America put the current administration in place. And they still make that claim after the elections last week, but rural America, is, as you all know, is a lot more than just ag. In fact, it's a lot more manufacturing dependent than it is ag dependent. So that's the argument on the job side, but at the end of the day, we haven't seen this yet, but what I think possibly could happen, we get in a full-fledged price war or trade war, um, and given how much we talk about exports, but we import a lot of agricultural items, both products food items as well as bulk items. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's seasonality too, right? Seasonality. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually, it's got to build into the cost of food. Yeah, and absolutely. inflation in this country. So that's when people, I think, will start making some, some noise. When, mm -hmm. It's like we got to stop. Start hitting them. Yeah. yeah, it's like I got my job. <coughs> yeah. So I don't know. Is that logical? I, I think if it hits your, uh, your guacamole for your Super Bowl, <laughs> I'm telling you, riots in the street. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's much more integrated than people imagine. I mean, look at uh, feeder pigs coming from Canada, Western Canada. Coming to the United States, we have a lot more slaughterhouses apparently in the U.S. They got the slaughter weight, they're slaughtered, made into bacon. We export back to Canada and Mexico, right? So there's a lot more integration that exists. Um, also, you see this a lot with, with genes. Genes are mostly made, a lot of them are made in Mexico. Well, but the only thing is, is that the cotton, we know that the... The cotton industry in the United States has an efficiency that's much better than it is in Mexico. So the cotton is made probably 16, 17 states and exported zippers from Georgia down to Mexico. Because of that, it's, it's able to be imported duty free. If that product was Chinese origin, if that cotton was Chinese origin, those genes would not qualify for the free trade agreement. So there is an integration that exists. And when you, when you ruin imports, when you really hit imports and, 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 and restrict them, whether it be through tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers, you, in essence, are sometimes hurting your exports. My last company was doing these mechanical joints on the polyethylene pipes. Regardless of what people think of, I mean, the reality is, is most of those are not made in the U.S. anymore. The we see paper. a lot of this in the meat industry where animals are born in one country and then cross fed out in another country and then processed them in back and forth. Mm -hmm. So it's hard kind of to get the true net impact, I guess, Kenny, from, from the livestock sector. Yeah, the deficit in many ways is kind of difficult. To Do you know if there's ever any discussion of, we always talk about the, the meat trade, but mm -hmm. it's like the live, the live animal trade never gets discussed in these agreements, but I would argue that Canada's more dependent on us than we are on them because of the live animal side. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I would say so. It's not like if you were going to retaliate, yeah. that'd be an easy way to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and um, now the interesting thing about this on the supply management side of life is um, the reason that Canada was so concerned about the dairy industry is that there's probably more cows in Wisconsin than there are all Canada, <laughs> right? So they worried about a flooding of the market. That was the main concern. Yeah. But you don't hear as much. You're right. You don't hear as much on the live animal side as you do. And there's a I would say there's an advantage, you know. I mean, also the advantage if you look at it from the perspective of, in order for, I mean, looking at the bacon side. So, I mean, in order to, uh, they don't really have, apparently they don't have the facilities as we do, you know, mm -hmm. say slaughterhouses as much as they, you know, um, to do that. And they're very dependent on that, you know. So that's one way to hit. I don't, I don't know whether there's a capacity. The problem is, is okay, if we do that, is that gonna hurt our industry by restricting the feeder pigs coming? I don't know. No question, it would, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know much, but yeah. So. We've, we've talked some about on the meat side, but Jonathan used to work and still does with our farm analysis program. It's some of our most 
innovative businessman and farmers are actually his colleagues would work one on one with a lot of producers out there in the state okay. and mainly crop farmers. Okay. And just Darren wants to know a lot more about what's happening in the ag economy. Tell tell us Jonathan, he's, he's a, one of our PhD students now. Uh, a little bit about the financial climate out there, especially from the crop side. And some of these younger guys who didn't think prices would ever go down. Right. Yes, I mean, it's a, it's a tough, very tough climate. I mean, very small to negative profit margins across, you know, especially the grain crops. I mean, we're largely below the cost of production for corn and for soybeans in, in a lot of instances. The trade thing did not help that, you know, when we went from 850 beans to 750 beans or whatever the case may be. Uh, corn wasn't hit as far. We were kind of already there mm -hmm. at or below break even on corn. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and this looks like it's going to continue out. So we've got a lot of tough decisions that have to be made as far as... <coughs> How many people are going to be able to stay in the farming industry? When Why things not? were good, they got overcapitalized. Very much so. Rents too high, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, even now, you know, those that that made money in the good years are starting to eat into that at a pretty rapid rate mm -hmm. as far as their accumulated net worth. So some people are choosing just to get out. You know, those that are more mm -hmm. mature that nearing the end of their you know career anyway. But the young farmers hit especially hard. Um, but, I mean, the, the climate out there, for the most part, I mean, if you had to note it generally, is um, <clears throat> while they wished that prices were better, they're not really upset with the trade policy. Mm -hmm. They feel as though it's something that was a long time coming, and they're, I guess they're willing to take their licks now if, if it helps mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so. Now, these uh, trade payments, they got half. In the other day, we were, uh, Kenny and I were, with Lacefield, and he indicated it sounds like they're going to get the second half as well. So, uh, what a dollar sixty-five for soybeans? Yes. Yeah. And then, I mean that that. What is that? Though? Real so money. Dollar sixty-five. It's part of the aid package. Okay. So, you know, the twelve yeah. million dollars. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So you, based off this year's production, so it's a dollar sixty-five per bushel of beans that you produced. Okay. Um, or a penny per bushel for corn. <laughs> so penny per bushel. Yeah. Wow. Um, and yeah, I mean, people are happy to get that, but I don't think that that's that's not going to solve all the woes. And, that, and that's harvested beans. Correct. Right? That's actual. And the, okay. the big thing right now, especially in Central Kentucky, is the beans are poor quality and still standing in the field in so much so wet conditions that yeah, and we got a lot of rain, so they're also beans laying on the ground. Okay. And so we're trying to figure out: do you harvest? Well, or do you, no. not, I mean, do you, at, when you harvest, because there's going to be quality issues as well. We are the other days up to as much as $3 a bush. Oh, yeah. Discount. Yeah. Mm. So you tack that on to uh, the low yields. Mm. It's not. So they're getting well, that guess, money if, so $3 a bushel, you're just saying, they're getting that if, 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 if it's harvested, right? No, that's, no, that's, no, that's a discount, discount at the elevator quality. for quality. Oh, discount. the discount. Okay. It's penalty on quality. It lacks quality. The prices okay. are down from eight nine dollars a bushel to okay. seven or eight. So maybe yeah. talking about hundred hundred and fifty dollars an acre, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Swing. Discount. So it's kind of a perfect storm, especially for central Kentucky. You've got yeah. trade issues, it's lower prices, and then we've got this, you know, at my farm where where I live, we're like twenty three, twenty four inches above normal rainfall for the year. So it's just okay. created a catastrophe. Yeah. And well, it's I guess not just some of the argument years. is yeah. in terms of the aid and not going to, unless it's been harvested, is that, well, the the trade agreements, et cetera, are hurting price, but production is still functional of weather. But I guess the counter argument to that is it's not going to be reflected in on crop insurance. So you're still losing out. There, there is, yeah. I mean, so there. I guess there is some protection in there for quality issues. I'm not sure exactly. It's not the as Revenue good. based. If you have a revenue based po policy, there is if some. You're yield based. Yeah. If you're just yield, of course, you're not going to get anything. But the yields are still pretty good. But, my, but am I correct that to the extent that the aid is supposedly tempering poor effects uh, to producers because of 
uh, trade agreement that that's not reflected in the revenue insurance, right? I mean, because that's still based on current prices. It's not based on prices plus aid. Right. Yeah. So right. So, so most people are choosing to, to go so ahead and harvest. Is my point. They, probably they, don't, they don't know where to go with it. Right. And not a lot for of a lot of folks, it's going to work out the Me and RF tell them where to go? <laughs> we don't take care of quality, unfortunately. There will be a, I've, I've seen the case where that dollar sixty-five is going to offset basically the damage that they've got. Now, of course, there are some salvage green situations where people are getting docked three, four, five dollars a bushel, but I think that that is, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, the beans that are still out on the ground today, I mean, they were probably nearing that, you know, more and more. Uh, but, but see, the thing is, is, that was the, you know, I go back to, it's, it's like you John said, it's always it's kind of like the perfect storm that would have been unfortunately, unfortunate to face because, you know, because of the cost of production is a lot lower for soybeans than corn, right? A lot of, we had record bean acres in the state, mm -hmm. and that was more potentially a, a, a bank-driven issue mm -hmm. rather than a choice to continue crop rotation by the farmer. So you had record number of bean acres. Then you hit the trade issue hits, and then mm -hmm. weather damage hits on very slim working capital to begin with, probably for most farmers. Mm -hmm. But but then on the opposite side, you've got corn in Kentucky, which has done phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at we're looking at statewide averages of 180 bushel of beans. Look at corn. And corn exports are up 17 percent. And so we've been, you know, blessed even with low prices of growing, growing ourselves out of the. Where are those corn heat? exports going? What's the primary market? Uh, we could send a lot, both Canada and Mexico, as well as Japan. Okay. We process a lot though for the animal industry here too. Oh, the animal yeah. industry. Sure. Yeah. Feed. Because we're feed because of our poultry, uh, poultry so with, company. With some uh, apologies twofold. Number one, I have to leave here oh, no. uh, shortly, but need, also okay. apologies for switching topic, uh, but. Really would like to get your insights, if I may, Darren, on uh, internship oh, sure, possibilities yeah. for graduate students. Sure, uh, yeah. Not well, undergrads too, I guess. The point. Sure, yeah. But uh, internships and even job opportunities later, sure. etc. Sure. So for uh, for internship possibilities, we do have an office here in Lexington, um, and we do accept applications for students to apply. I give you my card and be happy to have students just to, directly to me. Um, and usually we have the students do a variety of things. Um, uh, you know, one thing that they've worked on for me is uh, they've actually pulled trade statistics for me. So Klein is looking, a uh, good, good example is Dee Dee Williamson, maybe you know the company, Caramel Color, they're right global. So they wanted to see actually exports of certain regions to the world and see if it's saturated. Right, and it's a great opportunity for the students to look at, you know, how is U.S. Census data calculated, understanding a little also too the mechanics of, you know, its origin of movement data, N doesn't necessarily mean that it's manufactured in that location, you know. So they work on things like that. Um, they've also worked on, you know, coming with me to client sites, taking notes, um, you know, as part of that program. Um, on the educational programs, they always accompany students, but they can always apply directly to me. I give you my card. And uh, we have them once, we usually have two per semester. And then I've had occasionally had students that we've had a project we're working on. So for instance, looking at maybe what other World Trade Centers are doing around the United States or what other export promotion agencies are doing in regards to agriculture, in regards to automotive, and have them do a benchmark study. That's actually something that has been very helpful for students, for us uh, to be more effective as students doing that research and going on websites and making calls, and they seem to enjoy it as well, yeah. So, yeah, I'll give you my card before we have to leave. Any final questions? Or I'm questions? wondering if, so none of these internships involve some of the uh, field work uh, associated with uh, that uh, brewery Trail. by chance, okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't advertise that, we'll get like a thousand hours. Yeah, exactly yeah. for that one. Thank yeah, you. no problem, thank you. But I do have a question on the, the brewery example, or with, against the grain example. Sure. So for a company that size, which is, I've been to their operations there, it's, it's relatively small craft beer sure, yeah. operation. For a company like that, how much does it cost the company mm -hmm. to 
to enter into one of these international markets? Sure. Rough estimate, that's probably. Yeah, it really depends upon the industry yeah. because sometimes you have, uh, I'll give you an example. So if you're going to enter into uh, Canada for alcohol, mm -hmm. it seems like it's a relatively easy market. It really is not. <laughs> it's a very complicated market. <laughs> um, it really depends. I mean, I would say that, I mean, we've had clients that have entered the market in terms of getting prep and everything else for as low as $25,000, $30,000, you know. And then I've seen clients that have gone way above that because they have a highly regulated product mm -hmm. that requires, it really depends on what market you're starting with. Mm -hmm. um, I can say for the Abu Dhabi example, mm -hmm. there's a lot of zeros there, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. Um, so it really depends. Um, I would say that the main costs are always related to staffing. If you need to staff up a little bit, um, the logistics costs, mm -hmm. um, the 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 factor of I messed up my trade terms and now I have to pay five thousand dollars in storage. I call that the mm -hmm. five to ten percent factor. <laughs> Inevitably, I have clients do that, but it's usually the the bulk of the costs related to moving the product mm -hmm. and the legal fees if you want to get a distributor overseas. And I've seen distributor agreements that. You know, a couple thousand dollars, and I've seen distributor agreements that cost twenty thousand dollars for a lawyer. So the, so as far as the, what does the World Trade Group? But do, do they charge yeah, a fee? Charge. And is it? And what doesn't seem like that expensive. It's two thousand dollars an hour. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we. I um, mean, it seems pretty. Yeah. If, if the total cost would be roughly thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, for I mean, I give that as an yeah. example of maybe just an industry that's not highly yeah. regulated. Um, we do things where we do like an export 101 mm -hmm. on site for clients. I mean, generally we are averaging on an hourly basis between 100 to $150 an hour. Okay. That's not yeah. right. And point of clarification, on, uh, so I can understand. You also though mentioned potential of needing staffing, and I assume that would be an ongoing cost and versus the yeah. initial 25 or yeah. so. Yeah, so if, alone. so for instance, I give the example of my last company. We all of a sudden got a job related to UAE, and then we needed somebody for a temporary basis to process the visas, because I myself could not do them. I was not in country at the time. We had to hire someone, a contractor, and we ended up paying them probably, for the half year, we paid them $25,000. So it may not be an ongoing then? It, it may, may not be an ongoing. It's very ad hoc at times. It's very random. Like, hmm. we needed the guy that was a specialist in American Society of Mechanical Engineer coding that had a background working in the Middle East. Not your typical person. He was not cheap. Hmm. And he shouldn't be cheap because he's got a specialization. Yep. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've tried to emphasize in the ag world, <coughs> there's so many different trade resources out there between the U.S. Commercial Service, the yeah. Southern U.S. Trade Association, which is money that comes from the Farm Bill to help small businesses in trade missions. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to you know, do some of this market research. There's a lot of resources out there. And even KCAR, for those of you familiar with KCAR, is, uh, is a group that basically works with businesses on developing business plans and marketing mm -hmm. strategies. Uh, I mean, FAS is a substantial amount of grants. Service. Yeah. There's so a lot of resources out there. Yeah. There's a lot of grants available. I know FAS has a matching, some sort of matching. Yeah, I think if you yeah. do trade shows, they match the amount. and. I mean, with as a will as a way, I, I find a lot of clients end up finding some sort of grant process or, um, you know, even for instance with the with UK, my, my hope is at one time that when we do work with companies that are SMEs, that we partner at some point a lot more with UK and with undergraduate and graduate levels and they actually execute the market research. SMEs? Uh, so, I'm sorry, small and medium-sized enterprises. So, okay. more, not the valvelings of the world, but guys who are starting out, and, and and maybe a lot of export accelerators around the country uh, have had a lot of success in utilizing the undergraduate and graduate population of local universities. Hmm. And and quite frankly, it's a great conduit. I mean, I know for myself, my interns are now employed. Some of my interns are now my clients, which is that's wonderful, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's what I want. You know. Um, when they yell at me, it becomes frustrating. Right? <laughs> but I mean, um, <laughs> but I mean, that's where I think there's an opportunity. There is, I think this. We've seen some research from the undergrad and the grad students at UK with this. Well, uh, this this is the uh, MBA program. 
where the people have gotten back from the companies, whether it be Alltech, and they've said, wow, I didn't know about that. I wasn't aware of that. That's pretty good. And we've got a few of them that have been hired. So there's no reason we can't do that at the, uh, at the small, medium size companies as well to partner with universities. So, so I was, one other thing was that uh, just heard someone on the radio today where Brian Quarles was talking about wanting Kentucky to be a center for the agricultural technology innovation. I don't yeah. know if that would affect you guys, or I know it would be beneficial for universities if something like that took place, but uh, yeah. I didn't know what kind of discussion would come out of that. Yeah, I think, well, one thing is actually specifically addressed within the USMCA about access to, um, for U.S. Uh, export to product, you know, and technology and also cooperation between U.S. and Canada, U.S. and Mexico. Um, where we would be involved, I think, would be more on, um, not obviously the innovation side of making you know, technology, but in terms of supporting maybe the export of that technology or maybe, you know, connection with the university overseas. A lot of that evolves from discussions with Pierce Lyons at Old Tech. Yeah. That was, mm -hmm. that's, was his dream. That Kentucky becomes the Silicon Valley in terms of technology. Yeah. Right, right. So <laughs> Ryan has bought into that. So they, they, they're talking. All right. So. I can understand why you would say that, but a lot of people want to be the Silicon Valley of something. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Absolutely. Darren, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you, it. You know, we've Thank got. Opening discussions and hopefully we can have some partnerships yeah, absolutely. down the road. So absolutely. We will spread this information to our students and grad students. Uh, yeah. And again, uh, maybe you and, and Ed can come back some other time. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. I, I was telling Will is that I've been in the automotive side and the construction side, and I was saying that you know I'd like to learn more about. I can't help so much on the international if as, if if I'm not really versed on the domestic side, right? So, like, someone is talking to me in Canada about the dairy industry, and I'm thinking to myself, well, how does the dairy industry in the United States work? I, right? I know more about the Canadian dairy industry sometimes <laughs> than I know about the U.S. dairy industry. I've already told him about January and February in Kentucky, so we're going to get Darren out on the extension trail. There you go. Some of these folks, so. Absolutely. Thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.